Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to see so many familiar faces here and also so many faces I hope I will get to know in coming two days. And I came here to talk about my experience as an open and digital rights advocate, as a person being involved on behalf of civil society organizations in, in public policy processes going on both on national and the EU level. And I have confession to make. So if it comes to my work, sometimes I feel like this. I'm not sure this diet has changed, but it did. So sometimes I feel like this. And especially I feel like this guy standing at the very back of the field, you know, having his hands like this, wondering what's going on here, you know, because if it comes to public policy, if it comes to legislative processes, of course there are certain very strict rules, but many things happened simply happen behind this scene and many things don't have rules to, to guide them and you have to find your way. And what's also very important about public policy work and advocacy work, that you have to, play, you have to play on the field that is not yours and you have to play according to the rules that are not yours. And it's really challenging because when I think about, you know, my dream way, for example, legislation is made, both on Polish and the EU level, I would probably come up with another ideas. But, you know, it wasn't up to me, so I have to adjust and I have to find my way to get a ball and make some differences. And also, you know, being this guy in the very back, sometimes it's very easy to commit the sin of silence because I, I simply don't feel good enough or, you know, knowledgeable enough or welcomed enough. And that's simply challenging. So I came here to, to share this experience with you because for last almost three years, I and my dear friends here in this room, mostly from Comunia Association that I want really to acknowledge here, but also uh, other people from CC Movement, we have been involved in ongoing, um, let's say finished on EU level, copyright reform. The reform that we all expected to be, you know, game changer. The reform that we all expected to create future-proof, innovative, open copyright. And we advocated for copyright that would support and take into account needs of society, needs of human-centric technology, needs for people to get access to knowledge, to education, simply to strengthen the equality. But you know, while the process continued, I had the feeling, and I, I, I believe it's not only my feeling, but I had the feeling that we are not welcomed in this discussion. That our arguments are not taken seriously into account. And I, I questioned myself, why is it, you know? And the answer was really easy and, I would say, really painful on this personal level. Because simply this copyright reform, we were so looking forward and we all counted to change something and to create simply better environment for all of us and the society to grow, was simply told it's about money. And it's not only the case of copyright, I must say. It's the case, in my opinion, of many technological discussions going on nowadays. That we claim that, you know, AI development, for example, is about how to make money on this and how to strengthen European startups. That is, of course, valid concern and it's, of course, very important to do. But I tend to disagree with this narrative that you presenting some values or, you know, questioning this money only approach to technology, you don't belong to the narrative. You are not welcomed. You are undermined by your opponents just because you don't use these economic arguments, but you say, hey, what about, you know, freedom of expression, for example? What about my right to access to culture? But we, many people in this room, I believe we did our best. 
We were engaged in advocacy and public policy on various levels, starting from this very traditional approach by evaluating you know, proposals and provisions that were put on the table by drafting policy papers, but by making suggestions. But we also tried to raise awareness about this issue. We did some campaigning on copyright reform that is not very easy, as you can guess, because somebody told today, and I agree with this, that copyright is simply not very sexy. And also, you know, we were the one who asked very simple questions like, where are evidences? You know, because apparently still in 2019, evidence-based policy making is not a standard. So sometimes you see some proposal and then you wonder, how come you got to this idea? How come you got this idea to fix this problem with these tools? And we were said, hmm, we can't tell you because of the copyright. You know, evidence are copyrighted, so we can't reveal them to them, to you. And then um, we as a movement, we, we managed to get five million, more than five million signatures uh, opposing the most controversial right now Article 17, previously Article 13, that forced uh, internet platforms to monitor all user-generated content in order to avoid copyright infringements. That's, in our opinion, way too much, and it's not balanced approach to copyright protection. So we got those five million signatures, and of course, you know, many people claimed it's so easy to get five million signatures nowadays with open internet and with global internet. But let me ask you, when is the last time you've seen five million signatures opposing very specific legislative proposal? I, I can't recall. And of course, some people claim there are bots that signed this petition, but you know, we got used to it. But at the end, I must say that I personally felt, and it's not only my feeling, that we also became targets of various stakeholders in these discussions, especially in Poland, where copyright debate was really vivid and was really tense. You know, I personally and my organization, uh, we were accused of uh, being paid and serving big tech companies, or, you know, in some very uh, tragic moments to serve Russia as well. You can imagine how ridiculous it is. And, uh, you know, we were undermined and we were just disregarded in so many ways. And at the end, it's also a very hard confession to make, we kind of failed. The directive we got is not future-proof. The directive we got in the European Union doesn't take into account users' rights. The directive we got doesn't strengthen access to knowledge and culture. It's simply mostly about money, unfortunately. But still, I believe that from every failure in our life, we can you know, learn something. So uh, for the last few weeks, I have been thinking, what are the lessons learned for myself from this experience, from this more than two and a half years engagement of mine in this reform, and also of us as a movement. And I came up with three lessons I want to share with you. And it's not only about copyright reform, but it's broadly speaking more about technology debate nowadays we have. So first of all, I really believe that basic question matters. Because nobody tends to ask them anymore. You know, we discuss blockchain and artificial intelligence, and there are those very smart people asking questions on how to solve this very technical, detailed thing. And then nobody wonder and nobody question how this technology or how this um, implementation of the technology will affect society or, you know, how this copyright we will affect our freedom of expression online, for example. I believe these are very simple questions, but nobody but us, civil society and people in this room, tend to ask them anymore. 
And please never believe these corporate narratives that tend to, to convince you that, you know, you can only ask questions if you know right answers. I really don't believe in it. It's really the value in just asking questions and waiting for other people to reflect and to answer them. The second lesson is, and it's very important for me um, as well, is that we all, we all in this room and we all in our community, we have a role to play shaping technology and shaping the public policy on technology, on openness, on access to knowledge and education. And really, I believe it doesn't matter that you don't understand how artificial intelligence works. I simply believe technology is so present in our life. It affects every single aspect of our lives nowadays. How we learn, how we communicate with people, what relations we have, how we vote, what political decision we make. That no matter what your background is, if you are a political scientist, if you are, if you, if you are a philosopher, of if you are a person into agriculture, uh, you have something to say in this discussion. And don't be afraid to say so and to show your perspective on technology, on openness, uh, on, on, on free knowledge as well. And the third lesson is that damage control is important. And I know that in the world that you know, success-oriented narratives are the ones that are valued the most, this is not something very rewarding. Because with damage control, you just stop things from happening. You know, there is nothing you can be very proud of. But still, if it comes to the reform, I've just participated with my friends and colleagues. I believe that without us, even if we failed, that we, without us, we would have gotten much worse reform, much worse directive than that we finally got. So there is a value also in damage control. And you know, it's not a very proactive approach because you just react on, react on things. It's, it's not a very rewarding approach on this personal level, but it's really important. And recently a friend of mine asked me when I was telling her about my job, about my, you know, how I felt in this process, when I evaluated my last almost three years, she asked me, Natalia, how come, you know, people tend not to listen to you, you know, your arguments are undermined. You know, you, you are accused of certain connections that are not your connections. And how come you still, you know, feel this is important and you still have energy and power and you want to do this and you want to be engaged in various uh, digital rights, openness, and technology, public policy debates to come. And I just realized that the truth is very simple, that the more un unwelcome you are somewhere, the more you are needed there. Because I believe that, of course, the matter who I represent, the matter who I am, the matter that I'm a young woman, I, s I still hope I'm young, the matter that, you know, I make some mistakes speaking English, it matters, of course, all of this, but, you know, the fact that matters the most for my opponents and for people who try to disregard me in this debate, in this public policy debate, is not the fact who I am, but it's the fact who I stand for, what I stand for. And it's the fact what values I want to present, and those values and those arguments they simply make people uncomfortable. They simply make people to question their approach to things that usually is very straightforward, aim-oriented approach, but then you come and you say, you know, hey, what about access to knowledge? What about freedom of expression? Don't be afraid to raise those very big words in the debates you are participating in. And of course, I'm not the very first one who came up with this idea that the more unwelcome you are, the more important it is for you to be there. So I will leave you with uh, the words of the first congresswoman of color. And she said that if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair for yourself simply. And I will highly encourage you next time, you will feel unwelcome, you will feel disregarded, you will feel that your arguments are not treated serious, seriously enough, 
just bring folding chair and make a difference in a way you simply can. Thank you.